And uh, now let me introduce you uh, the Professor uh, Simon Milne. Professor Mayn is the Professor uh, of Tourism of the Auckland University of Technology and Director of the New Zealand Tourism Research Institute that recently has focused on better underst uh, understanding the links between information technology, tourism and local economic development. He has considerable international experience in local uh, and regional economic development, uh, tourism strategy, having conducted tourism research in uh, the five continents. Professor Mayn has worked as a research consultant for a range of New Zealand and international organizations, including the United Nations Development Program, UNESCAP, the World Tourism Organization, the European Union, Luxembourg Deve Development, C CIDA, the Chilean uh, Regional Development Agency, and the Organization for American States. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Simon Mayn. Uh, it's your time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, a pleasure to be able to talk a little bit about the place that I call home, which is obviously New Zealand. Uh, I'm not sure how many people here have been to New Zealand for a holiday or a visit. Okay, obviously I have a, I have a bit of marketing to do today, um, get a few more people to come. I want to I tell you a story really, I want to tell you a story about New Zealand's success as a tourism destination and the way in which we've built and developed a very strong brand. But I also want to tell, tell you a little bit about some of the challenges that we face at the moment. And I want to talk about how we're trying to address those challenges by getting local and slowing the visitor down. And I hope there'll be some themes and some ideas and, and uh, thoughts that might may be of relevance to you wherever you may come from. So as mentioned, uh, I'm based in New Zealand, but the institute that I direct has done work in many parts of the world. Uh, this is just a diagram that shows the areas that we've worked in the last 15 years. And wherever we work, I think it's fair to say that we see some common uh, global challenges with tourism. We're always, wherever we are, trying to capture the visitor, trying to bring them to, to our place, to attract them from other places. We're trying to sustain the resources upon which tourism depends, the physical environment, the cultural resources which are so important to tourism development. We're trying to improve quality of life. We're trying to give the hosts and the residents in these places some reason to support tourism. It's, a, it's an old saying, but it's a good one. If, if tourism works for communities, then communities will work for tourism. If the quality of life of communities is diminished, they'll be less responsive to and less willing to work for tourism. We're trying to raise awareness of the industry also around the world. I think wherever we go, there's a desire to make sure that politicians are more aware of the importance of tourism. There's also a desire to make the young people of uh, today, who are the citizens and the workers of tomorrow, more aware of the importance of the industry. And I think the bottom line is wherever we look, there's a desire to increase visitor yield. If we can get the visitor to spend more money, we don't have to have so many visitors. And that can help us create a more sustainable industry. So really there's a close link that I want to explore today between increasing visitor yield, which is at the heart of the New Zealand tourism strategy, and also building community de development, because communities are at the heart of our tourism industry and at the heart of the tourism experience. So, as you know, we're a small nation and we're very much on the periphery of the world. It takes around 25 hours to fly from New Zealand to Europe. So it's a long journey and despite that long journey and despite the fact that we're on the periphery, we have done, I think, quite well over the last 15 years promoting ourselves and branding ourselves as a place that tourists should come to. And in fact, there's just been some recent research released in the last week that shows that the Chinese consumer now ranks New Zealand as their number one destination to travel to in the Asia-Pacific region. So our branding of the country as 100% pure has been a successful approach. And in fact, when we look at the country brand index reports, you can see that in 2011 and 12, New Zealand was ranked number three. Uh, just recently, the most recent, we've dropped down to number five, but we're still doing very well for a small country. We're punching above our weight as a tourism industry. And that effect of branding 
has done a, a lot to help us grow our visitor numbers. And you can see from the diagram here that numbers have grown from only 100,000 visitors in 1965 through to nearly 3 million visitors today. And we have a population of just over 4 million in our country. So the numbers have been growing. There have been some ups and downs, but we've seen consistent growth over this period of time. And we've also seen growth in a number of key markets, growth in spend and in visitor numbers from Australia, which has always been our largest market, an increasing number in recent years coming from China. China is now our second largest tourism market. And we've managed to also consistently maintain numbers from our long-haul markets in Europe, the United States and elsewhere. However, we do face some serious challenges. While our numbers have been growing, and while our overall visitor spend has been growing slowly, the spend per visitor, which is this red line here, has actually been dropping. Year on year, for the last decade or so, the amount that each visitor spends when they come to New Zealand has been declining. The yield per visitor has been dropping. And that's a concern for us. We don't want to be in a situation where we are bringing in more and more visitors just to keep the economic benefits of tourism where they are. We want to be getting more impact, more yield from each visitor. We want to be able to grow our industry without having to attract millions of more tourists. Because if we do that, it's going to be harder to sustain the environmental and cultural resource base upon which the industry survives and depends. That challenge, that, that problem of yield is shown also when we look at a national level, when we see that tourism's role as a proportion of our gross domestic product has fallen steadily over the last 10 years, from around about 5% down to around about 3.5%. So while we are th I think we're very correct to trumpet the value of our brand and to talk about the fact that we've done a very good job internationally, we have this ongoing challenge of how do we build visitor yield. Why has that yield been falling? Well, we know that one of the challenges that we face is the rising value of the New Zealand dollar. And you can see against the US dollar, it's almost doubled in the last few years. That's not something we can control greatly, but it's, it's a factor in the mix. Some of you may also be aware that in the last few years, we've had some major earthquakes in New Zealand. Uh, they've killed 300 people, but they've also damaged the, the South Island's tourism industry considerably. The earthquake in Christchurch destroyed 50% of its accommodation stock. That's also created a slowdown in some parts of our industry. It's also had an, an impact on our ability to build visitor yield. The growth in the Chinese market has been very strong for us. It's a positive thing, but the Chinese visitor doesn't stay as long. They don't spend as much money. And in fact, for us, one of our key strategic goals is how do we start to build the free and independent traveller from China? How do we move away from the packaged traveller to those travellers that are going to explore the country more and spend a little bit more money along the way? So the changing market mix of our, of our tourism industry has also had, I think, some impact on that lower yield per visitor. The problem of yield has actually been the focus uh, for the last few years and has come to the fore in our new New Zealand tourism strategy, which was just released in the last year. That tourism strategy takes us through to the year 2025. And you can see from this figure here that the focus is not on building visitor numbers, it's on building total tourism revenue and in particular on building yield per visitor. To achieve that goal of $41 billion by the year 2025, we have a long way to go. Currently, we're generating about $28 billion. So we're going to have to increase that yield considerably to, to hit our goals. That means an increase in visitor numbers, but an even faster increase in the spend per person. How do we do that? 
What are some of the things that we're trying to achieve to, to get to that higher yield? And what role does information and communication technology play in that? At a national level, our marketing focus has been on what we call the interactive traveller. An interactive traveller doesn't mean someone who wears a hat, as is in this case. What it means is someone who is actually using technology to plan their travel, using technology to talk about their travel afterwards, people that are interested in authentic travel experiences, people that will one day go bungee jumping and do something adventurous, but on the next day are quite happy to lie and relax in a five-star hotel and eat wonderful food. It's all about trying to bring experienced travellers to our country and to, again, try and build yield through this particular market, which could be coming from the US, from the UK, from Australia. It doesn't really matter where, we just want the increasingly high-yield interactive traveller to come to our country. Part of that focus of building yield is to develop new product and new marketing campaigns as well. One of our new product developments is to create cycle trails, which will allow cyclists to move from the very north of our islands right down to the very south. And in doing so, they have a chance to interact with and get involved with the local economies along the way. We're trying to focus very much on encouraging those Chinese travellers that are an increasingly large part of our market to also take the time to interact and connect with the economies around them, to drive cars themselves, to go on the cycle routes, not to rely purely on packages and on bus travel around the country. And of course, in terms of marketing, we've been able to build on the success of movies like Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. How many of you have seen Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit? OK, a lot more than have been to New Zealand itself. <laughs> but you can see here that this, this whole focus on the Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit has been used very much as a tourism branding and tourism development activity. We've got tours, we've got activities which bring people to re relive those movies that they've seen, to, to walk in the steps of Gandalf the Wizard and The Hobbit. It's all part of our attempt to, again, build visitor numbers and also, in, in the long term, build visitor yield. I think these are nice ideas, and I think our strategy is doing some very good things. But I'm afraid to say that I don't believe that these approaches are what is, are going to solve the long term problem of the increasing visitor spend. Tourism yield has to be driven by other things, and it, and it really relies on, I believe, the visitor having greater interaction with and connection to community. And I believe that community themselves have a very important role to play in building visitor yield. Visitor yield, we know, is driven by and can be enhanced by improving the visitor experience. Our research in New Zealand shows that that visitor experience is most readily increased through interaction with community. Community involvement in talking to visitors and in sharing with visitors their experiences, getting them to link to local economies. But we know that in the long term, this can only work if that yield also comes back to the community. We know that if tourism degrades the resources upon which community depends, if people feel overwhelmed by tourist numbers, if they are losing their quality of life, that tourism yield won't grow because the community won't welcome those visitors and the visitors will be eventually feeling like they've been turned away. The challenge really is, I believe, to actually enhance the community involvement in tourism through information and communication technology. I was listening as best as I could because I don't really understand uh, a lot of what was said this morning, but certainly I could read from the slides that we've got a big focus here on robotics and we've got a big focus on social media and new technologies and that's absolutely fantastic. It's, it's really the future of tourism. But I would say that we must keep the idea of community at the heart of what we talk about when we're trying to develop and enhance tourism. And when we talk about information technology in tourism, we need to think beyond marketing and reaching the visitor 
to how we actually engage community and build the capacity of community to interact. It's fine to have an interactive tourist, but unless there is also an interactive community to engage with them, we are not going to see yield increase in a sustainable way. And that's important because it's, when we talk about national yield and we talk about national revenue, that all comes from people spending a little bit more money in that local shop. An extra dollar or two in the local bakery. An extra few hours as they wander through a local community. That's what really counts in the long run. Every drop, every dollar that is spent is what eventually builds our overall revenue and our overall success of the industry. So we must always think about the local when we're discussing those national dimensions. And from my perspective, this is really where the message starts. We have to enable the interactive traveller to interact with our local economies. We have to support community and their attempts to build and link to the tourism industry. And that's all about slowing the visitor down. This is a, a sign which sits just outside Auckland City on one of the islands in our, in our harbour. And as soon as you get off the ferry and you start walking or driving on, onto the island, this is the sign you see. Slow down, you are here. Take the time to engage with us, and we will take the time to engage with you. Now, there are traditional ways that communities have slowed visitors down. One of those is to put some toilets into a public accessible area. But we all know that a toilet only slows you down so much. You can develop the toilet experience. <laughs> you can put in all sorts of new technology, but still, it's a toilet. Of course, communities have taken other approaches as well. We have information centres where, again, you're encouraging visitors to gather knowledge about what surrounds them, to spend some time in that information centre, interacting with maybe the local guides, and that's another way to build that link to the local economy and to slow the visitor down. But of course, as we, as we all know, the most significant approach that we can take is to give visitors information about what they can see and experience before they arrive, to make sure that there's plenty of online information once they are in that community so that they can look at it with their smartphones, their tablets, etc. And we also need to make sure that the tourists can talk about their experience and be our ambassadors once they leave through their blogging, their social media interaction, etc. What I want to talk about now is the approach that we are taking to try and build visitor yield by getting local. By not just giving the visitor more local experiences, but by giving the community the tools and the approaches to link more effectively to tourism. I, think, I like to think of this as C2T, or Community to Tourist uh, Development. That's really what this is all about. Because we can't have an interactive tourist unless there is also an interactive community. And this slide just really sums up what we mean by the get local approach. We want to slow that visitor down. We want to give them a reason to spend more money. We want to do that by giving the visitor and the community a sense of place. What makes this place unique? What makes this community special? We need to involve not just businesses and tour operators, but residents and community groups schools and other groups within that community to help create that sense of place and to also build an understanding within those groups of what makes them special and what makes them unique. And we want to place information and communication technology and also community informatics at the centre of this, this Get Local strategy. I now just want to give you an example of how the Get Local strategy works, the kinds of tools and techniques that we use. Uh, this, this is obviously from a New Zealand perspective, but we do this work in many other parts of the world as well. Every context is different, every approach that you adopt has to be different, but I think there are some core ideas and, uh, and themes here that will resonate for you here in Barcelona and, and, and elsewhere. 
I'm going to use some examples from Auckland, the city that I live in, which has a population of around about one and a half million people. Uh, I'm also going to use some examples from the rural area of the South Island, the very bottom of our South Island called Western Southland. A group of communities in a region that has been trying to slow visitors down as they travel on this route called the Southern Scenic Route that links Queenstown, our major winter resort, to Dunedin, one of our largest uh, southern uh, cities. People have been driving around this route and they have not been slowing down. They have not been stopping in Western Southland. We're finding ways through this model to encourage that slowing down, to encourage those linkages. Now, there are a series of phases that we can look at as we develop uh, a get local approach. Not every community will adopt all of these phases. Some will come in at a certain time. Some will ignore some phases and jump straight to a later phase. But I just want to talk through clear, very sort of in a, a very systematic way the kind of approach that we take to help build an interactive community, to help build the capacity of a community to use information technology to engage more with the interactive tourist. The first step that we use is a very simple one. We simply audit and look at what is online about your community at the moment. Are you well represented or are you invisible online? And the resources that you do have online, are they something that you have had some say in or are they being created by outsiders? Is the message that's being presented about your community a unique message, something that creates a sense of place? Or is it generic and has it been created by someone from a marketing or web development firm who doesn't really understand who you are as a community? This audit is a very powerful tool to help people understand where they presently are, but it's also a very powerful tool to motivate community to take their own steps to tell their stories and to have them represented to the visitor. Seeing stories and getting ideas from this audit as a community member that makes you feel that you are not being well represented or accurately represented is, a, is something that forces you to take action. So it's a very important first step. And we look at that from a global scale right down to the local scale. What kind of information is being presented how well is that information presented online? Are you just selling beds or are you linking your accommodation to other sectors of the economy? Does your culture, do your natural resources shine through to the visitor before they arrive and when they are actually in place? So we're not just talking about marketing the product, we're talking about marketing the sense of place. We're trying to create a unique sense of place for these communities. And very often what we find is communities are quite shocked when they see how they are represented online to the overseas visitor. They're quite shocked to see the kinds of comments and feedback that are being presented by visitors through social media. This is our way to engage and get communities to think more deeply about how their voice can be heard and how that can begin to stimulate economic development and yield. The second phase that we adopt is to gather a group of people from that community, not just tourism stakeholders, but a range of individuals, to begin to work as champions, to begin to train and mentor other members of the community so that they can start to play an active role in building resources, so that they can actually start to play a role in engaging with the tourist. And the key message here is that these community members are not just tourism business owners. They may be the local school teacher, they may be the local uh, gas station owner, they may be people who are somewhat peripheral to the direct impacts of tourism, but we're trying to drive home the message that tourism is everyone's business. The negative and positive impacts of tourism affect everyone. A decline in visitor yield affects everyone. A sense that you are being overcrowded as locals affects everyone. We need to make sure that those visitors that are coming to that community are hearing the message of the community, 
if they are going to interact effectively with the local economy. And I think one of the first lessons that we always learn from this work is that very often when a community tries to go out there and present itself to the tourists, the very first thing they want to do is have a brand. The challenge is that if you start to build a brand too early, and if you start to present a brand too early, that can actually create a lot of tension within community. Not everyone is going to agree with that particular statement or that particular one word that's put out there. And in fact, we see that with our New Zealand brand at the moment. 100% pure New Zealand is a great brand. But are we really 100% pure as a country? Environmentally, are we living up to the expectations that are created by that brand? Many of our tourists don't believe that once they actually come to our country. So for a community, the first step is not always to have a brand. The first step is actually to work together and to see what your unique sense of place is and how you can collaborate and work together to achieve that sense of place and to let a brand emerge organically. The next step we talk about with these communities is about gathering data and information about who is coming to this location, how your industry is working, how effectively they network together, and also how your community feels about tourism and the way that it's been developing. This is gathering data, but it's not big data. It's actually what I would call small data. When we look at big data, and New Zealand is very good at capturing and generating good big data on our tourist industry, it's fantastic, but it's very difficult to translate that into meaningful information for local communities. Local communities do not always find the, the, the fine-grained information that they need to make good, good decisions. So phase three for us is about building decision support systems for communities. It doesn't ignore the big data, and certainly the big data is very valuable in helping set the broader context, but we need to understand what is happening at that local scale through the collection of small data. And in the regions and in the communities we work with, we use online survey techniques, we use the simple gathering of data that's already been collected by individual businesses to start to draw a bit of a picture for what is happening to the tourism industry in this location. And to get a feel for what is the local yield of the industry. If we can understand that, we can also measure the performance of that local industry over time. So small data is very valuable to small places. In the case of Auckland, I'm just looking at one example here, an area called Puhoi to Pākari, which is a region just north of our downtown area. We can gather data that looks at visitor flows. Where are people going to within this region? Where do they actually go to within a particular community setting? How can we begin to shift some of those flows to perhaps reduce some of the tensions that exist around overcrowding? Or to perhaps increase some of the yield that is being missed out from certain localities? How can we actually understand from the community what they feel are the negative impacts of tourism coming tourists coming to their place. It's important to think about growing yield, it's important to think about marketing tourism, but it's also important to think about how this impacts upon communities. We know that, but research can play a role in this as well. In the same way that we want to measure changing visitor spend and changing visitor satisfaction, we need to do the same for communities as well. And if we can begin to highlight the fact that things like traffic congestion, Things like overcrowding are a problem. Oops. We can start to address these issues. Now, this, I, this is our equivalent of overcrowding in New Zealand. I think it's quite different when you look at parts of Old Town Barcelona, for example, where you've got crowds and crowds of people. For us, crowding is very often around transport, cars blocking roads local community feeling like they can't get access to their facilities because tourist numbers are growing. And very often what our research shows 
is not just that the community sees these as negative issues, but also the tourist. So in the same location, we've asked the same question to visitors and they're giving us the same answer. We are feeling overcrowded. There are places in this destination, in this community, where we feel we can't travel easily. Those are the hotspots. Those are the tension areas that we need to plan for and develop further so that we don't see a degradation in visitor and local experience. And information and communication technology is central to us gathering that data through online survey techniques and through other tools, using smartphone apps to, again, gather information on where people are travelling to and what, what, what their satisfaction is with that travel experience. So I can't reinforce enough that small data is just as important when it comes to building visitor yield at a local scale as large data. The next step, once you've worked with community to understand how they're represented online, once you've started to get an understanding of what tourism means economically and how community relates to tourism and how they feel about tourism, is to begin to build experiences that can connect the visitor to the local economy. And those experiences can be developed through trails, they can be developed through networks of businesses, that group of people that have been involved in the web audit and are starting to be the champions of community in terms of a tourism sense, they can be very active in beginning to drive this development of networks and trails. We can use all sorts of tools and all sorts of uh, mechanisms to gather from the bottom up, from the grassroots, the kinds of stories and information that make up the rich fabric that create a visitor experience. So these are some examples from that same area. Vineyards, local food producers, schools, arts and crafts activities, all starting to have their voice heard. Also stories about local beaches, local physical landscapes, which have got indigenous people, Maori people, have, stories have existed about these places for centuries. How do we share those stories with the visitor? How do we make that come alive, the landscape, the culture for the visitor? That's what slows the visitor down. Now, in the case of this region, this information now is layered into a very effective website, a website that talks about the range of activities for the visitor, but is also a resource for the local population. Just like the best museums and the best waterfront developments around the world work for locals as well as visitors, we believe that the best community and regional marketing, tourism marketing sites also work best if they're giving something for the community as well. These sites aren't just about marketing to the visitor, they're about connecting to your community members who have left to travel to a town or to live overseas somewhere. They're about attracting doctors and teachers and other people that you want to have live in your community to come to your community and spend time there. This is not just about tourism development, it's about community development. It's about making tourism work for community as well as having community work for tourism. And we can see a presentation of a range of different vineyards and beaches, but the critical thing here that has been driven is meet our community, connect with our people, connect with our businesses, learn about our place and spend more money, increase yield. The final phase, and this is the last little section of the talk, the final phase takes things one step further. And for some communities, this is a phase that they very much want to engage with. This is about the community coming together to build their own online resources in a more formal way, to create a community-based and focused website from the bottom up. We use a technique called web raising. Uh, I'm not sure many of you are familiar with the, uh, the old stories from the US. There was a book called Little House on the Prairie, which used to be on television. It's a, a popular book. And 
people in, uh, in, in these Western communities in the United States, when a new family would arrive, everyone would come together and build a barn. That barn was a collective resource for the community. We see this as the same thing. The website is a collective resource for the community. And the process of building the site, of get, getting different community members to come together and to understand how they connect, is every bit as important as the final site that is produced. So the process of getting people together and to think about the resources that they think should be on that website is part of this development process, is part of the capacity building of community. So we get the community to work with local businesses and to derive a series of topics that can be part of that website. And those topics are not just about accommodation and places to go as a visitor. They are telling the story and they are creating the unique sense of place which makes this particular community different from others. It's all about trying to attract the authentic, seeking, interactive traveller. We work with local school children to actually develop podcasts and videos which can be then of interest to the families that come to this area who have got their own children travelling with them. We often forget the important role that children play in this process. And in the process, we're actually building the capacity of local communities to use information technology. Much of the funding for this work does not come from tourism destination organisations or from tourism marketing funds. They actually come from strategies that are designed to increase the uptake of digital technology and IT skills among rural and urban communities. Tourism represents the hook to engage communities with the use of technology. So we're building the capacity of communities to use technology and to interact with the visitor. And that, in the long term, I believe, is what can increase yield over time. So in the end, what we have are sites that create, are, are, are characterised by authentic community content. They are built from the bottom up, and that's what really, I believe, the authenticity-seeking visitor, the interactive traveller, is looking for and that's what can drive increased interaction. This is just one of the examples of a web-raised site uh, from Western Southland. Each community within that region has a chance to tell its story and to focus on the everyday events which are going to be of interest to the visitor. And what we really, I think, understand now in tourism is that it's your or our everyday life that is actually the visitor experience. It's not packaging and developing new things that we think the visitor will like, it's about taking what we already have and sharing that with the visitor. It's about the interactive community interacting with the interactive visitor. Each business and each community has a chance to develop its own micro-trails and to use the small data that is being collected from surveys and other tools to make better decisions and to put forward to the visitor the little micro opportunities that exist to spend a few more hours in the community and to spend a little bit more money. And just like it can attract people to certain areas and bring certain opportunities for more spend, communities can also tell the visitors where they would rather they didn't go and they would tell the visitors about the things they would like the visitors to treat with some respect to help sustain resources in that local area, to reduce some of those tensions that can sometimes arise between host and guest. We're also able, as I mentioned, to create podcasts and videos which we can then run through smartphones, etc. and as people travel around a community or around a region they can connect to the stories, the videos and the podcasts to make those places come alive. In the same way that a picture comes alive in a museum when you've got a set of headphones on and you can listen to that. That's what we're trying to achieve here. But we're trying to give the community the capacity to do that and to build those skills. This is just one person that's part of the, one of the communities we're working with. 
She'd never used computers. She'd never done a podcast before. She's learnt those skills over time. She's told the story in a podcast about some of the bakery that she does in her cafe and how she uses some of the recipes that have been passed down to her by her grandparents. She's telling a story that the visitor can relate to and she's, she rang us a couple of days after her first podcast was put onto the site to say, I've had a visitor, they've come from Australia. They'd seen, seen a video and they'd heard my podcast. They've come into the cafe to taste my grandmother's recipes and now they're spending some time walking through the community. They may have only spent an extra few dollars. They may have only spent an extra few minutes. But it's that little bit of extra spending that creates the yield that in the long run leads to a more successful and sustainable tourism industry. So I think just to conclude, what I'd like to drive home is that national and regional branding and marketing is obviously vital. New Zealand has done a great job in branding and marketing itself as 100% pure. But that hasn't led to increased visitor yield. The only way I believe we're going to sustain an increase in visitor yield is to build content and information and marketing material from the bottom up. Interactive tourists require interactive communities. Local stories and knowledge are what will in the long term enhance competitiveness and build a sense of place. That is what underlies yield. Local data, small data, is just as important at the local scale as the large data. And we can't forget that. I know there's a big focus on, on big data and it's, it's justified and fully understandable, but we've got to understand how that translates to the local scale and how we can build decision support systems for local people. So I firmly believe that information and communication technology can help to build more sustainable tourism development at the community level. But that if we're going to build yield in the long term, we have to build the capacity of community to interact as well as the capacity for tourists to interact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon, for the, your inspiring words and for this complete definition of uh, responsible tourism. Ahora es el momento para la sala. Eh, estamos a disposición para que tanto Simon como Julian puedan uh, responder a sus preguntas. Sí. Sí, okay. Um, hi, my name is Nuria. I'm from Pantry for All, that they're creating local experiences accessible for everyone. So my question is that we had another presentation before about robots, and they say that uh, New Zealand is using drones with tourism and creating experiences and videos. So if you can tell us something about uh, this. And another question is that um, I saw on YouTube that there are influences like the British uh, YouTuber, it's called Fan for Louis, that they are telling their life and traveling around the world and recently they went to New Zealand. So if you notice about that and if you are using it as a marketing strategy, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, thank, thank you very much. I, I'm not sure I fully understood your last question, um, but uh, I'll do my best to respond. Um, certainly, New Zealand is at the forefront in using drones. Um, we have very uh, liberal legislation about the use of drones, so people fly them all over the place. Um, I guess for me, the key message is that technology, robots, uh, drones, all of those things are very powerful tools to enhance the kinds of things that I've been talking about here. I don't think that you can sort of say technology and robots sit over here and community sits here. The, the two connect very much together. And in fact, um, we are 
we are very interested in particular in the way in which drones can help us also understand some of the tensions and pressures that come from tourism in terms of helping to map out areas of conflict between community natural resource use and visitor natural resource use. So drones are not just a marketing tool and a tourism development tool, they can also be a very powerful tourism management tool as well. Um, I'm not sure I understood your second question about the group coming from England. Can you maybe just clarify that? Uh, it's a YouTuber that I follow that it's, it's a British one. It's called Fan for Louis. And they travel around the world and they if, um, post on YouTube their experiences and they interact with local communities, yep. they travel, they live experiences, yep. and they share with their community and their followers. Yes. So if you're using this. Um, well, I think New Zealand has been for some time at the forefront of trying to use this kind of user-generated content through videos and other tools to spread the message of what we do. One of the, one of the really interesting areas uh, in New Zealand is that, as you know, we're an agricultural economy. We have a lot of what we call woofers or uh, willing workers on farms who travel around and there have been attempts, I know, in recent times to collect the individual stories through videos and other things of, of those individual woofers about the experience that they have had. So a absolutely, I think we see and we've been at the forefront, I believe, as a, as a nation in seeing that every visitor that comes to us is an ambassador. The stronger experience they have and the better experience they have, the more they're going to share that with others. So it's absolutely critical for us. Sí. Sí. Yes, it's also for Simon. Um, how does Australia fit into your strategy? Do you see it as a competitor or do you have plans to collaborate with Australia? That's a very good question. I think we always see Australia as a competitor when we're playing uh, rugby in sport. Um, but uh, when it comes to tourism, uh, we do work quite closely. Um, our research over the years has shown that um, Australia is actually not so much of a competitor as something that we can add on to our New Zealand experience. For example, there was work done many years ago which actually asked people to think about the colour that most summed up New Zealand and Australia. New Zealand, that colour is blue or green. In Australia, it's red or brown. It's a, it's a drier environment. In many ways, I think our competitors are Chile, uh, British Columbia and Canada. I think Australia is actually a place that we need to be linking more closely to in terms of our strategies. Um, there's no question, though, that the Australian market is the dominant market for us. More than 60% of our visitors come from Australia. They have played a very important role in helping us through some of the uh, crises that we faced as our long-haul markets decreased, as the, as the financial crisis hit Europe and North America, for example. Our big challenge right now, and why so much of this work I've just been talking about is important, is that the Australian economy now is starting to move into a crisis. It's actually slowing down. That could have a major impact for us. Our New Zealand dollar now is on a par with the Australian dollar. So we have to look at ways to get more money out of each Australian visitor that comes to New Zealand. So yeah, we, we, we try and work closely. We certainly collaborate. Um, we certainly have a degree of competition there, but I think actually we have much more to gain from co-opetition than competition. Hi, my name is Anina Binder. I'm working in a consulting company. And I really liked your whole concept of increasing yields with the community, the whole the, the concept. And I have two comments. One was that your second most visitor is Chinese. And I think it's a really good idea to increase this community sustainability concept and not increasing the number of Chinese tourists. And I think it is a long-term strategy because at the moment, I don't think there are a lot of independent travelers that come from China yet. But maybe in a long term, they are coming. I don't know if you did some research on what Chinese travelers are coming and so on. 
And the second comment is that I think it's really interesting for Catalonia as well as the tourism is quite centered in Barcelona and, may, and they want to get the tourists out to different um, places in Catalonia. Yeah. So it's exactly what you are doing at the moment, this com community. Well, can I just concept. make a, a couple of comments? Those are very interesting statements. Um, I would have loved to have shown you more. Uh, the Chinese issue is a very important one. Part of our strategy is to encourage the free and independent Chinese traveller. And I remember when our strategy was released just a year and a half ago, I was sitting in the audience when the presenter was saying one of our strategies is to make it easier for Chinese to drive cars in our country. My initial concern was, well, what does that mean for our roads and for our communities? I'm not saying all Chinese are bad drivers. That's not the case. But the bottom line is that they are coming from a country and a, and a system of driving which is very different to our own. And I'm afraid to say that that has now become a major problem. Uh, in the last uh, few months, we have seen a really dramatic increase in the number of car accidents that have involved Chinese tourists. And we have actually had in recent times a problem of local people stopping Chinese drivers while they're, while, you know, not you know, on the side of the road and taking the keys from them. Um, and this has actually made, this has made international news and has become a big issue now within the country. So it comes back to what I was saying earlier. We have this great idea about having a free and independent and more interactive Chinese tourist, but we are not preparing the communities for that first. And we're putting the, the cart before the horse. We have to make sure if we have any strategy to create a more interactive Chinese visitor that we think first of all about the community and how they are going to interact. It's about Chinese signage, it's about understanding Chinese culture. We don't know that very well and so this is a big area and right now we're kind of retroactively trying to deal with these, uh, with these problems. As far as Barcelona goes, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm very privileged at the moment to have a, a, a PhD student from Barcelona. She's working with me in New Zealand. Her interest is linking tourism, food and community development through information technology. And she's going to use for her PhD a case study from Auckland and also a case study from just outside Barcelona. I'm hoping through that that we have more opportunities to build links and understanding because I think we, we share some very similar challenges uh, and at the, at the heart of those challenges really are how do we help communities better engage with tourism because in the long run that's what creates the, the broader economic benefit that we're all hoping to achieve. So I think, I think Marta comes back here in June to start her PhD and I'm, I'm sure she'll have a chance to meet many of you along the way. Okay, la última pregunta. Hello, my name is Carlos from Fantastic Transmedia. This is a question for Simon. Thank you very much for your presentation and the approach you made about uh, communities. One question, because building communities is, is a process, okay? And it takes time. Eh? I, I can believe that initially can be an approach to be kind of volunteers that bring to the community, but in the long run, what kind of reward do you think has to be give to them? It's a kind of money or, well, your opinion, please. Yes, that's a good question. And in fact, I, um, I missed at the very end there a slide because I was running out of time that actually addressed that question to some extent. Um, let, me, let me answer this in a few ways. The first is that, yes, this is not a short-term process. Um, many of the programs that we're talking about here have been taking uh, a decade to come to play. And I'm also, I would be wrong to give you the impression that everything works. Um, we have had many cases where we have worked successfully for a few years with communities and things have, have not been sustained over time. Things have actually collapsed. Um, we learn from mistakes. And I think one of the key things that we've learned is when we talk about community, we also mean business. And one of the first things that we now try and focus on is the fact that there are local businesses who are also community members. 
but very often those local businesses have got the strongest vested interest in making a new website or building that opportunity to increase visitor yield. So if we can somehow connect their motive for profit with their community-based motive for an improved quality of life, we start to have some very strong champions that can help to move this forward. In the long term, the best reward is increased jobs, increased income, and better opportunities for young people to, to remain and, and work in these communities. Um, that's really the reward that we have to try and generate. And the only way that we can show that that is happening is through small data. Um, we, we don't have that kind of information available through the big data sets that we have, but if we can do the kind of research that I was talking about, that helps communities measure their own progress to the goals that they are trying to meet. And that's really the best reward possible. And I think... Um, what I should say is when I talk about conducting a survey, I don't mean something that's done once. What I'm talking about is a barometer of change over time. And we can, we can find ways to collect data very cost effectively to, through, through tools like crowdsourcing to get all of the community involved in that process. And over time, what we are able to then achieve is a barometer of that measures change over time. And in that case of Western Southland, we've certainly seen very good examples of increased visitor spend, increased stay, but more importantly, lots of good examples of, of improved networking within communities, businesses working together, schools and other groups actually realising that they're part of that tourism mix. And we, we need small data to help us measure that, and that has to integrate and link to the big data that we've been talking about as well. I hope that answers your question.